pick up where we left off on Tuesday, we were looking at the structure of all vessels. We talked about the arteries, we talked about the arterioles, and now Neil is talking in really good detail about the capillaries. So I want to read you the um, capillary structure because we're going to put into practice its functions all semester long, or for the remainder of the semester, really. And what we learned or studied and pointed out yesterday, Tuesday, is that our capillaries do not have that smooth musculature like the rest of our blood vessels do, nor do they have that outer uh, connective tissue. So no stick connect, uh, muscle nor connective tissue structure to these types of vessels, which makes sense when you think about the purpose of the capillaries. The purpose of the capillaries is to exchange plasma and interstitial fluid content. Okay? And so the more barriers are, the less likely that will happen. So there's very few actually stringent barriers to where they can filter and continue to pour. We talked about, we reviewed how particles can be passively moved across the membrane. We talked about our passive transport, like diffusion, if a particle is liquid soluble. Or if it's not liquid soluble, it can go through an opening. In this case, in the capillaries, there's just anatomical pores between our endothelial cells that let particles uh, diffuse between the two spots. Then we learned, well, if something is not lipid soluble and it's too big to fit through the pores, one or two things is going to happen. We said, one, it can be endocytose and transcytose and exocytose. This will be reticulated or actively transported across the endothelial cell. Or we said, what else can happen? Well, what, what, about a, what about a protein that's, say, too big to fit through the pores? Proteins are not water rich and they're not liquid soluble, and they're too big to fit through the pores, they can't diffuse across the cell. They stay inside the, in the capillaries. So products that are water soluble and too large to diffuse through, and that are not endocytose across or transcytose, they stay in the, in the capillaries because they're physically restricted. In there. Do we identify something else that is not transported or filtered out out of capillaries? Size large proteins? Large red blood cells. Our big red blood cells are just there. There's no physical way for them to get out the interstitial fluid, and there's no reason for them to do that. If they did go out into the circulation like that, through the interstitial fluid, our, our, our circulatory system would be open and not closed, and we would have difficulty getting those blood cells back to the heart. So they would need to be in there for multiple reasons. Did we talk about the pressure here in the capillaries? No? Um, the pressure, if I'm trying to filter something from the lumen of a blood vessel to the interstitial fluid, or from the plasma to the interstitial fluid, there should be a pressure gradient. Where would the pressure be of the greatest amount? Inside of the capillary. So why don't you just draw a large letter P to indicate greater pressure in the plasma and a smaller P in the cellular gradient. The pressure is forced, forcing these substances out. natural progress, what should probably happen as well besides this filtration? 
I don't know if you want to draw them a separate image or not put it on there so you don't get confused. But once filtration, re if filtration occurs, we have more fluid over here, so the pressure becomes a little bit more greater. So we actually reverse the gradient. And so in the way that our capillaries pick up substances from our tissues, say hormones, nutrients, whatever, waste, is by a process called what? Reabsorption. And that's when the pressure gradient switches. We can reabsorb substances as well on our capillaries. Tuesday and just readdress, but um, we'll go ahead and formally fill in your handout. And capillary pressure is low. It's <laughs> lower than artery blood pressure. It's lower than arterial pressure, but it's still enough to filter. So if you remember, our blood pressure continues to decline throughout our systemic circuit. So it continues to decline, even so the capillaries, but it's still enough of a pressure gradient to force force our filtrate out into the interstitial fluid. And the whole point is what you understand about the circulatory system. It distributes oxygen, hormones, nutrients, whatever, right, to unload those products into the actual tissue for their use. hone in on the role of the arterioles. The arterioles, if you remember, are those vessels that can constrict and dilate that influence the bulk of the flow into a, a particular capillary. But there, sometimes some capillaries have uh, multi-unit feed muscles around the vessels leading up to and can additionally control the distribution of blood into a capillary bed more or less. So those multi-unit cells constrict or dilate. But um, to look in better detail, the term um, ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration is more specific. You can use the word filtration, ultrafiltration. It's okay in this class. And what we learned is when the plasma moves across the capillary cells in the interstitial fluid of the plasma, the term is called ultrafiltration. And therefore, the pressure gradient is pushing that filtrate out, just forcing it through the little pores. We identified our proteins, and what else can you add in here? Your name of the capillary? Red blood, Red blood cells. However, once filtration occurs, we identified that the pressure gradient can switch a little bit, so we can also get some reabsorption using the same solubility size type of lubrication. So the pressure gradient reverses. So now in the interstitial fluid, pressure is pushing in towards the capillary to allow for the intake of nutrients, waste, hormones, you can fill in the blank, so that pressure gradient can force it back into the capillary. Collectively, these processes are known as bulk flow. Bulk flow is the sum of ultrafiltration and reabsorption at a particular capillary. Bulk flow is a generic word to distribute this, describe a large movement of something. Here we're looking at blood plasma and interstitial fluid. In the respiratory system, we'll look at gases right, moving across the membrane of our lungs. Yes, there any gas? Uh, at the arterial end of our capillary, that's right, the word at the arterial end. At the arterial end of your capillary, there is more filtration. At the venial end, there is more reabsorption. However, both processes can occur along the length of any given capillary. So it's not just like 
told her to go bring the stuff here, and she did, so she starts here in Lambert Town, and it turns across the lake there to the Apple Lake. circulatory system. So there's kind of a collecting. What's happening to the diameter at the venules now compared to the capillaries? It's actually getting bigger. Mm -hmm. At our capillary, let me go back and review this real quick. In our capillaries, blood pressure is still moderate. Okay, it's more than in the, in the, in the, ve in the venules, excuse me. What about the flow of blood? What about the velocity? Well, it's the slowest because what is greatest here? The what? Well, the pressure's the pressure's dropping, so it's still moderate. But what influences the velocity of? The lumen size does influence it, and it's the collectively the cross sectional area of all those vessels. So what happens is the cross-sectional area <coughs> of the surface area drops, or uh, excuse me, increases, so our velocity actually drops. It's an inverse relationship. So our blood is distributing over a wide area, and so we take it longer. So our blood pressure is reclining, and our velocity is plummeting. Okay, so it's like just barely, barely kind of taking through the blood vessels. Once blood gets into the veins though, the diameter begins to open up, so the speed begins to go back up, yet the pressure is still declining a little bit. So our venules are going to pick up the speed, but the pressure is dropping at the venules. Is the blood pulsatile or laminar in our capillaries? Laminar or steady? In the venules, it is also laminar and steady, not pulsing again. Where does the pulsing stop in our vessel? Arterial. Drop the pulsing and plummeted the pressure. All right, so the venules then drain into our veins. And if we compare those to our um, arteries, we learned that both vessels have large diameters large diameter lumens, but the veins are even larger than the arteries. And so what is low? What is, if the diameter is large, what is dropping? The pressure. The, the pressure is dropping, the resistance dropping, so we're decreasing or reducing factors. We identify the blood pressure is nice and steady, or in other words, it's not pulsatile. It's no longer pulsatile, it's nice and steady. And throughout the veins. 
between the pulsatile versus kind of flowing laminar uh, distribution of blood in an artery versus a vein if you've ever seen an injury. If, a, if an injury is not as damaging to, to an organ or a region of the body, the, if the vein is cut, which is more superficial to your body, the blood should just kind of, kind of leak out or pour out. However, if there's a more traumatic injury and the injury is more deep and the artery is damaged, I know some of you guys are in the medical field, what happens? <laughs> I've got some real like visual. All right, so it actually spurts. Each stroke volume right, gets pulsed out. And so that helps back up the um, fact that blood is pulsed high on the arteries and not in our veins. The next bit of information is going to be repetitive for what we learned, just trying to reinforce uh, what we studied on Tuesday. We said the blood pressure continues to decline throughout the system, so it's significantly less than in the arteries. We also learned that our veins have large diameters to drop their resistance so that our blood can right, return back easier. One second. And then we also identified that our veins have valves in them. What is the role of the valve? pump and just basically simply breathing helps bring blood venous blood back to the heart if you've been in lab or you did your pre-lab for today you know that when you breathe the pressure <coughs> changes occur in the thoracic cavity and they actually inverse with the abdominal cavity with each breath okay so when your pressure is great in your thoracic cavity it's going to drop a little bit in the abdominal and then and kind of switch out. So it almost acts like a mechanical kind of massage, if you will, on the blood in the abdominal cavity. So it helps propel that, that venous blood back up to the heart. It doesn't go down to the extremities when the abdominal pressure is high because we have valves. So this breathing helps you return your venous blood back to the heart. Another pump is called the muscular pump and just physical contraction of your skeletal muscles helps return blood back to the heart. So you guys that work in the medical field, you know that if you have a patient who's maybe uh, bedridden, and having low blood circulation, lethargic or pain, you can give a massage them. Okay? And just give them a little massage to help the tendency to push that blood right to the muscle muscle contraction and control the blood. There's devices Device. Yeah, sequential compression device. Yeah, sequential compression device. There's a sequential display 
Images from your textbook to reiterate this about the respiratory pump. You know that when you inhale, uh, the pressure in the thoracic cavity is going to drop, and that inversely will change the pressure in the abdominal cavity. And the squishes on the, the veins and the abdomen help propel blood back up to the heart. a little bit of sense about how breathing can physically bring blood back to the heart. The next few images are there to illustrate the uh, muscular pump. And so if you remember when we studied skeletal muscles in chapter 12, we learned that even though our blood vessels are there to distribute blood to an organ, the action of the compression of the organ itself actually hinders the distribution of blood, the arterial blood. And then when we squeeze on our veins, illustrate this um, for example um, those of you that are in the military or the band or whatever there's your marching band what do they tell you not to do one thing when you stand in formation they say don't lock your knees or they say don't activate your muscular pump is what they meant to say when you lock your knees you compress the large muscles in your legs if you're maintaining contraction, what's not happening? No blood flow. Mm -hmm. And so what happens? You pass out. Your nervous system says enough of this. Override. You fall down. Your muscles do what? Relax. And your heart gets some blood. Question? So the respiratory pump, is that another way of like extra exercising? Is that another factor of producing blood? It is, it is one factor why. Okay, so um, certainly breathing more forcefully is going to help bring blood back to the, to the heart faster as well. But obviously there's a more direct reason why you would breathe deeper and faster is because your metabolic demand has gone up significantly and you're getting more blood flow. But, but yeah, you're right. It does facilitate the blood exchange. Additional questions? Carbon dioxide will cause your pH to plummet. You become acidic. You may pass out. So, uh, also, you're not going to get the right amount of oxygen. So, you're going to accumulate carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide builds up disproportionately. Your oxygen will decline. So, even if even if you change your pH, you're going to begin to run out of oxygen, anaerobic glycolysis. voluntarily kind of take a few labored, re regulated breaths, you won't hyperventilate them. So don't hold your breath. We're going to also have the oxygen on some kind of problem. Additional questions? At this point. So uh, for the last day, we looked uh, collectively an hour or so. We looked at the different structure and Structural properties and functional properties between our arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. We also talked about the blood velocity and the blood, blood pressure. Here are the different uh, amounts of venous or I think I thought we just said whether it's hollow venous. We also talked about the role of each of these vessels. What questions do you have about some of these vessels that you look at? originate or begin 
kind of a backup mechanism, if you will. It's not the only role of them, but when we're looking at them with a the capillary, they have an accessory role in that, if you remember, when we looked at the capillaries, we said, when phosphor filters out, they close the intake tract. Remember that?
charging a new cell. And so any new traffic through that travels through the node is going to have kind of a um, checking cell, if you will, and monitoring everything. And if anything passes through the node, though, that the body deems harmful, the cells are going to go to they're going to go past it and try to get rid of whatever it is. So if I notice that, we can fix. We can go to kill the node, do the next, and kind of swell up and make the body may not think you're sick, you don't feel sick, because your immune system is probably not being swelled up or swelled up enough. So you're allowing your immune response to function in your body. So uh, that's some important roles of the lymphatic system. Figure 1338 helps illustrate for you the relationship of the lymphatic vessel with the circulatory system. And how you can actually see how um, the lymph is drained into the, into the venous supply. And then down here, got a nice little lymph node highlighted for you. Any questions about the lymphatic vessels, how they take in the remaining transport? What, so what happens when it causes them to not drain properly? Like what causes water? Uh, in the lymphatic vessels, um, it could, just like any other part of the body, be one of many factors. So um, I can envision you could probably even get a, a fat clot there, you know, in the, in the lymphatic vessels. I, I'm not really familiar with those, but I can envision fat globules getting trapped in there. Um, some pressure gradients, maybe a hydration issue might contribute to that, or just poor general circulation or mobility of a person who's not moving about. I can envision having poor lymphatic circulation uh, as well. So um, you could have probably many reasons that would cause that. Do you know somebody that had? I, um, when I was shadowing for ultrasound, there was a, I was at Children's and there was a little girl and we could see her limp, but like we were looking, she huge face. I mean, she was just super, super swollen. The rest of her body was fine, but all up here, I mean, it was like three times. Her head was like three times the size of the rest draining. of her body. And it was the lymph that wasn't draining properly. Like we and could see, yeah, we could see, you know, where the fluid was. I just, I didn't know it. I mean, that's that. certainly not common. Right. Um, <laughs> it sounds like maybe the entering point probably from the head region into the heart somewhere along that way is blocked, but I don't know what would cause it in the head region other than maybe yeah. just a design problem genetically. That the, the, the vessels might have been designed improperly and, and not structured to take functions so they're not functioning properly. I'm not sure. That's quite uncommon. Yeah, I, they don't, I mean, they just take the pictures and give it to the doctors, but I was... In, that case, in that case, I would think if there's a lymphatic problem, you would see it more in your lower extremities, where people have swelling and then gravity, but uh, it just seems completely uncommon. Has anybody else seen that by chance? Yeah, that was just kind of blowing my mind a little bit that it would be the head region. I could see it accumulating where someone's sitting and gravity is like pulling against or whatever, but the head is really odd, so it just seems like the vessel yeah, I mean, it was dangerous. Kind of she was having trouble breathing because she yeah. was so swollen up here. So painful. So I'm not sure. We'll have to look into that. We have already identified, but I wanted to quantitate this with an image from your textbook about the changing or declining pressure of your blood throughout the circulatory system. We know that there's a pressure gradient. We know that it's graded in the arteries. It meets in the veins and continues to decline throughout the system. But um, it just retains the information that we discussed on detail. Without a gradient, there would be no what? No distribution, no blood flow, and certainly no transfer of nutrients. So we have to have a gradient to distribute the blood. This is summarized for you. And, um, we're okay to move on? This is summarized. Whoops, sorry. Sorry. The last point that I have up here in this presentation is we noted that the greatest change in pressure drops or plummets at the arterial. This is just restating that. Now, the image, theater 14, 9. Um, I want to 
address this image for a moment. One, it, it tells us a lot of information, but there's a clarification that I'd like to have uh, about this image. If you have a used textbook, it's, it's probably already fixed for you, but if you have a new book, you might want to fix it. If you don't have your book, let me write it, write it down for you. But to walk you through this image, we're plotting, the image is plotting pressure, and the y-axis, and then on the x-axis is just the different vessels. And the chart is the line going through is just the pressure. First thing is, we can see in the arteries, the pressure is described as what? The blood pressure is pulse high, which we can pick up on our different color charts. As the blood enters into the arterioles, it is still pulse high. But what I want you to fix is, I want you to get rid of that pulsing in the capillaries. So if you have your book, I want you to flatline this pulsing in the capillaries so that it flattens out actually at the arterial in the arterioles leading up to the capillaries. The blood flow is not pulsing in the capillaries. So let me get some shape. You can also see this dramatic drop in pressure at the arterial from about 100 millimeters of mercury down to about 40 millimeters, right? So a drop of 60 millimeters of mercury in pressure, the greatest drop that we see in the, um, in the blood vessels because this where we see the greatest change in resistance and diameter on the, at the arterial. And then we get in the capillaries, the blood pressure is still what compared to the veins? It's still higher. The capillary blood pressure is greater than that in the veins, but it's still dropping, still continuing to decline. So by the time the blood gets to the vena cava, we lift the nerve up to the bladder, muscle and vein flowing into the bladder. Everybody catch what I was suggesting for you to correct? All right. Now I want to look at the control of blood pressure. This is going to be our theme from all semester long, so we're just repeating it. If I want to control something extrinsically, I can do it one of two systems. I can use the nervous system for what type of control? short term using the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. If I want to control something for a more longer duration, I can use the endocrine system. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the, a reflex arc. Remember we talked about the reflex arc. We need a sensor, integration center, and an effector. So we're just going to name those things. In the endocrine system, we'll pull back some familiar elements look at how these, these influence our blood pressure. So short-term control is, as you identified, regulated by the nervous system mm -hmm. by monitoring not only pressure but also some chemicals. So it's like mechanically and humorally regulating what's happening in the blood. And what the, um, what the nervous system predominantly changes to regulate quickly our blood pressure is changing peripheral resistance. So it targets which vessels? Which vessels can we quickly change resistance of? Arterials predominantly, the arterials. So we can call them, cause them to constrict or dilate really quickly. We can change that tube muscle um, status. And we'll see this just to, just to make sure you're, from moment to moment, your blood pressure is satisfactory. So whether you're, when you're changing from a sitting to a standing or to a lying state, the nervous system will quickly change your blood vessels so you don't fall over from a drop in blood pressure or keel over from a quick incline in pressure. So it quickly modulates that. I want you to add in here, in addition to peripheral resistance, it also influences contractility. Short-term is going to use the nervous system to change resistance and contractility of the heart. Is that okay? Long 
term, what do you think the body might change to change your blood pressure? Using hormones to change what? To what? Did you say protein? So some of the hormones are protein that is involved in this. Hmm? What do you think I could change? That would take a while to change. Your water content. Your electrolytes. So which organ do you think I could target? Kidney. Your endocrine system is going to target your kidneys to change your what? Water resources or secretion. So it targets your kidneys to regulate your volume of blood. go through and look at the neural reflex for our short, short term control over blood pressure and we'll just tie in our, what you guys mentioned about our reflex arc. In our reflex arc we've got to use receptors. In order to measure blood pressure we have what's called baroreceptors and they're located in our aortic arc and the carotid sinus. So right next to the heart and right next to the head and monitoring the This relationship is summarized in the image that you have in your handout. So if you look at the image, it has it's showing blood pressure and homeostasis, a kind of typical teeter totter seesaw kind of relationship. Yes.
then we drop the cardiac output, we drop the resistance, we should drop the blood pressure. Hopefully that should set that. I'll just plot your way through that first part of the image. I'll come back to this image. So if you look at this image, it's illustrating well, when my blood pressure goes too high, my baroreceptors communicate with the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata says, not good. So it controls the uh, uh, activation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic will prevail. Sympathetic nervous system activity will decline. So our heart rate goes down. Our stroke volume goes down. Cardiac output drops. Blood vessels relax. Our resistance goes down. And hopefully, collectively, our what, blood pressure to go back to Thank you. 
kidney, so it has to bulk up the actual bone. So the kidney can also influence blood pressure, but it's going to take a lot longer because it's changing the rate of the heart or whatever. It can actually change the entire volume and makeup of the blood. So if you look at this image, this summarizes the long-term control of the kidney over blood volume to bring blood pressure back to that point. Both the direct and the indirect mechanisms are illustrated in this image. So you can see the kidney, the scenario we have here is if our blood pressure drops, we could do the exact same thing to convert it to put our blood pressure high. So we're looking at a scenario where blood pressure is declining below a set point over a period of time. And following it in our direct mechanism, the kidney can physically, mechanically sense a change in blood pressure. If the pressure is declining in the kidney, the kidney <coughs> is going to then not filter as much. If it doesn't filter as much, it retains the blood, and our blood volume should collectively go up, and our blood pressure should collectively go this way. Up. So if our blood pressure is low, kidney's not filtering as much, retaining, and our blood volume should go up. If we want to have a greater impact on blood volume, though, we need to use a hormonal pathway. And what happens is this decline in, in blood pressure, this uh, is detected, and it causes the kidney to release a hormone called renin. So when the blood pressure drops, renin is released from the circulatory system, and this gets in the mode of this and that and that and that and that kind of pathway that you can take away from all the little arrows. Renin causes a cascade of effects. So if you look at all this on the right-hand side of the image is what we're calling the indirect mechanism. So you can see how indirect it is. Okay? Renin causes the conversion of this product called angiotensin II. We'll just take it at face value so that angiotensin II is, is converted. This thusly activates the adrenal cortex and the posterior pituitary to release two familiar hormones called aldosterone. Remember that? Tell me yes if you don't. <laughs> yes. And then anti-diuretic hormone is also released. Aldosterone targets the kidneys to do what? Reabsorb sodium. Now that term makes sense. We're taking sodium from the interstitial fluid and putting it back into our circulatory system. If we retain sodium, what follows by passive mechanism? Water. I keep sodium, I keep water, my blood volume goes up and my blood pressure should go up. <coughs> Antidiuretic hormone also targets the kidneys to directly do what? Reabsorb water, which causes my blood volume to go up, which causes my blood pressure to be increased back up to set point. You'll see this again in about a week and a half. Anybody look at this all day, every day, the hospital, yeah, anybody? Our lives? No? Does anybody know what this is? We're going to vet school. What is this? It's blood, okay, and it's called a blood smear. So, so you may have prepared one of these if you worked in a clinical lab or something like that. Just put a sample of blood on a microscope slide and look at it. And this is what you would look, see if you looked at it under a light microscope. And we can see some nice red blood cells, the most numerous cells in here. And if you look at your red blood cells, it seems really kind of strange based on what we've 
learned so far about this is that they don't have nucleus. This goes against our whole composition of nucleotides. Uh, we'll learn in the chemistry lab that regular cells develop to actually eject the nucleus and then specialize into this thing that is associated in your blood. So what's the case if you're a regular cell not free? Reproduce. Or make your cells make new proteins or whatever. So they don't live very long once they're out in the circular phase. They go out and do their job and they're done after a few days. Does anybody know how long a regular cell might live? It's, it's much longer than that. 120, 110, maybe 100 days, whatever. It's still a long time. A, a decent lifespan, but not collectively very long. The next image I have is a nice scanning image looking at uh, inside of a vessel, like an arterial or an artery. That's some red blood cells and some white blood cells. This image, just like all of the scanning images we've used all semester, have been colored post data collection so we can just visualize how they look. But you can certainly see the red blood cells. They were described as having a biconcave shape. And we'll address the purpose of that on Tuesday. And also, I like this image because it shows the white blood cells, the proportion. But look how the look at the white blood cells in their relationship with the vessels. What do they do? They're actually less, they're close to it. They're actually adhering. Remember we talked earlier this semester cell cell interaction and adhesion. Our white blood cells are chock full with protein, extracellular protein that just kind of extricate or roll along our white blood cell uh, our, our blood vessels to that and use protein to kind of walk along the inside of our blood vessels. And there's some deep flow to them that they precipitate and walk along with your blood vessels and, and all of your tissues to kind of scavenge and detect them out of the line of the body. Um, <coughs> know the average volume of blood and human? About five liters for ladies, about four liters maybe. Gentlemen, upwards of maybe six liters, right somewhere around there. You might know the uh, the pH of your blood. A little bit higher than that, even. About, it's about seven points. So what is it about seven point three five to about seven point four five is our blood pH. So a little bit more than uh, chemical. We look at the blood. Uh, actually, let me just go ahead and show this video. You might have heard the saying that blood is thicker than water. Well, the saying is true. That's because our blood is packed with millions of cells that float in a river of plasma. Most of these are red blood cells. They're one of the few types of cells without a nucleus or mitochondria. These flexible discs can bend and squeeze through the smallest capillaries of our body. They get their red color from hemoglobin, a protein that lets them transport oxygen throughout the body. This process keeps us alive. When blood passes through the lungs, millions of red blood cells pick up oxygen for transport to other cells in our body. When we exercise, for instance, our cells need more oxygen. Our lungs breathe in more air and our heart pumps faster to speed up the delivery of oxygen-rich blood. Red blood cells also act as garbage collectors. They remove carbon dioxide by carrying it back to the lungs. Every day we replace millions of these cells. Each lasts around 120 days. But our bone marrow continually replenishes the supply. Our blood also holds an army of white blood cells that spring into action upon infection. They defend our body against illness and disease. When an infectious agent enters the body, these cells rush to attack it. 
What makes them so effective is their ability to change their shape. They squeeze through the walls of blood vessels to battle the enemy head on. These bacteria cells don't stand a chance. White blood cells surround and devour them with ease. In the case of troublesome viruses, white blood cells produce antibodies that mark them for destruction. We also have other components in our blood that help control bleeding. Platelets unite to plug up holes in our blood vessels and stop them from leaking. Without them, we would bleed to death from the tiniest cut. The clots formed from platelets also keep harmful germs out. The cells in our blood perform vital functions in our body, delivering essential materials, removing wastes, and working together to keep us healthy. Cells. And there's also um, some other fragments called platelets that are in there that also give a nice immune function to our body. And so if we look at our blood, it's not just the cellular components, but there are also, there's the liquid plasma, which we identified way back in the early, early in the semester. So there's a liquid plasma, which we said is distributing gases, hormones, nutrients, etc. And certainly the liquid part, which we learned is the same. There's also uh, cellular components, those are sometimes called formed elements. We have our cells in there. We have our red blood cells, which are properly called erythrocytes, and our leukocytes, properties are our white blood cells. That clear term, red blood cells and white blood cells were more commonly utilized, but the other terms are more proper, as well as the platelets. I'd like for you to identify that the platelets are not entire cells. They're pieces or fragments of what used to be a, a complete cell. So there's a little uh, membrane enclosed cytoplasm. That's it. Uh, like calcium and sometimes other little protein uh, in there. But they're not an entire cell. They have an even shorter life than a red blood cell, just a few days to live. Because they're not alive. They're not metabolizing the blood. And what are they important for? What percentage of the blood is your red blood cells? Go to those and disappear. We'll let me know. Uh, CQ guys on Tuesday will pick up your nickname for other characteristics of the blood and then move through the rest of the system. But if you could uh, get Ms. Rowe your attention, she is going to talk to you about the respiratory therapy program.